and we're recording now. So let me go ahead and introduce our speakers. First of all, we have Bob Persing. Bob is the head of serials at the University of Pennsylvania Library, where he's worked for the last 20 years. For the last year and a half, he's been on loan half time to the Quali Olay project to build an open source ILS, working as an analyst for the Select and Acquire team. Bob has been active in NASIG practically since childhood, serving as chair of NNE and Publications PR, co chair of ECC and DD, as well as a term on the board. Next, we have Kristen Wilson. Kristen is Associate Head of Acquisitions Discovery at North Carolina State University Libraries. She chairs the Quali Olay e-acquisitions team and serves as the lead subject matter expert for the Global Open Knowledge Base Project. She writes and edits the column Electronic Resource Forum for Serials Review. And now, without any further ado, I will turn things over to Bob and Kristen. Okay. Thanks, Todd. Um, can you confirm, Todd, that you can hear me? Yes, I can, Bob. Okay. So I'm hoping everybody else can. If you can't hear me, uh, say so in the uh, Q&A box or the chat box. But uh, thanks for coming. Uh, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to start off, give a little background about the project, uh, and I'm going to talk about how we're handling print serials. And then Kristen's going to talk about how we're handling electronic serials. Um, we're going to show some uh, sample screens as we go along. We have to warn you that neither the print nor the electronic serial screens have actually been coded yet. They're in the hands of the programmers right now, so we can't give you a live demo. This is going to be just description and, and some screenshots that we worked up uh, in the design process. But let me make sure that the PowerPoint works. Yep. So just to start out, uh, what is Qualiole? So it's a project to build an open source integrated library system. It started out as an independent project, uh, first as a research project around 2008, uh, and uh, then went into the design phase in around the beginning of 2010. It was originally an independent project, OLE. OLE stands for Open Library Environment. Uh, but shortly before they began actually designing it, uh, they joined up with the Kuali Foundation, which is an umbrella group that handles a whole bunch of different software projects, uh, open source software projects for higher education. For Olay, there were a couple of big advantages with joining up for, with Kuali. For one thing, it meant they didn't have to incorporate, become a 501c3 or anything like that. Uh, but another advantage was that the Quali Foundation had already written a piece of software, a large piece of software called the Quali Financial System, which was a purchasing and budgeting system that they'd written for universities, you know, for the university level purchasing of everything that a, a university buys. And we saw some advantages to joining them so that we could reuse some of that code. And I'll be talking about that as we go along. So that's when the Olay project became the Kuali Olay project. We spend, unfortunately, a little too much time explaining what Olay and Kuali mean, but it doesn't, uh, the word Kuali doesn't matter so much as it, we're part of that umbrella organization. So as we've been designing the Olay project, the idea was to build an open source ILS that could be used by libraries of any size, but that would fit particularly the needs of uh, larger research and university libraries. And in the design process, several of the design principles are relevant to our serials work. Uh, first one being that Olay is trying as much as possible to follow uh, standards. Now, as we all know, in the, the library world, there are lots and lots of standards that you can follow, and sometimes you get to pick and choose, but the general principle was follow at least some of them, uh, the ones that seem most current and most relevant, and not try and define things on our own. The flip side of that, though, is that Olay is designed to be neutral about data formats. Uh, it is not necessarily designed as a MARC-based system. It's being designed to fully support MARC, but the idea is that it's going to be format neutral. It will support whatever format your data is in, so long as you can describe that format. Um, in the early releases, we've been focusing mostly on MARC because that's what our partners have the most of. You know, most of us, our databases are full of MARC records, but some of us do have Dublin Core records, and that's probably the second format that we're going to uh, 
support. We've been writing uh, editors you know, to edit the data. So we start with the Mark editor. Now we're going on to the Dublin Core editor. But if you have data in other formats, you should be able to load them, and the system will integrate them all together. Another principle that was important for this is that we, for the serials world, was that we wanted there to be no preference in the system for handling print things versus electronic things. Most ILSs that exist now were written in the days when you have primarily print-based or tangible-based collections. I'm using tangible to mean print, microform, CD-ROM, anything that comes in the mail. Uh, and electronic was usually added on as well. Let's see if we can get RLS to do that too. Here the principle was we want everything to be equal. Uh, and we want our ILS as much as possible to do the sort of functions that most of us have ended up doing with ERM systems. And Chris will be talking a lot more about that. By reusing the code base from the Quali financial system, one benefit of that was we got a very robust fund accounting structure because Quality Financial is intended as a system in which you can build a budget for the whole university and track all the assets, track all the uh, incomes and expenditures of a university. Uh, that means that you're getting uh, a higher level of detail usually than you would get at in a traditional ILS system. Uh, to many librarians, that level of detail can seem overwhelming at first because you get sort of 26-digit accounting strings that uh, university accountants are used to dealing with, where you have charts and fund codes and object codes and sub-object codes and organization codes. But what that means is that basically there's enough level of granularity there for you to be able to uh, account for anything you need to account for. Many of us have talked in the process about how our library accounting was not as detailed as we wanted, particularly as we've gone into the electronic world and we've needed to keep more track of what do we own versus what do we lease, that sort of thing. The level of detail that we're getting from KFS will, will make that a lot easier. And one interesting choice that they made very early in the project was to say they would not write an OPAC uh, because so many of the partners were saying, we have an OPAC that comes with our current ILS, but we either don't use it or we don't use it as our primary one because we've added this cover layer on top of it, viewfinder, blacklight, or any of a number of other ones. Um, so with Olay, we said, okay, we won't do that then. We'll simply write a back-end system, uh, and you can put whatever front end on it that you want. What that means is that Olay needs to be able to communicate with all of these front-end systems that are out there, the discovery layers, and send things in recognizable formats uh, and have that data interchange go. So as far as serials are concerned, the next question was to check in or not to check in. We surveyed the partners, uh, and Kristen has a slide that shows the partners a little more, but I'll just quickly describe them. Uh, there are currently, I think, nine partners in the project. The project is centered at Indiana University, which is the lead on the, the grants. Um, but then there's Duke University, North Carolina State University, University of Maryland, the University of Florida system, uh, the University of Pennsylvania where I am, Lehigh University, uh, Villanova University, and the University of Chicago. The University of Michigan is also an OLA partner, though they chose to be a silent partner. They said, we'll give you money, but we won't give you time, uh, because they had more money available than staff time. And we said, OK, we'll, we'll take your money. But as far as uh, tangible serials went, we did a survey of the partners. And there was relative uniformity in responses. Everyone said, we're getting a lot less tangible stuff than we used to you know, in the last 15 years been a steep decrease. But we're all still getting tangible stuff, and we're all still checking it in to one degree or another. You know, we've all heard the stories of places that have said we're going to stop doing serials check-in. None of our partners had done that, and none of us felt ready to do that. They, there was agreement within the partnership that we wanted Olay to have a serials check-in system. We wanted to, be, to have the option of keep checking in whatever we were still getting for as long as we were still getting it. Same thing with claiming. 
everybody in the partnership was doing some. They're doing less than they used to, not as many claims, not claiming as many types of material, but everybody's still doing it, everybody still wanted to be able to do it. So we used those as base principles as we went forward. Then the next question was about predictive check-in. The, the members of the OLA partnership are using several different ILSs now. Some have fully predictive systems with prediction patterns that are set up, uh, maybe using the MARC format, maybe not, but where the system tells you what, exactly what issue you're going to receive and when. Others of the partners didn't. Um, many of us who did uh, have full prediction systems. You know, we set them up in the 90s when we were still getting tons of print, and there was hope that this would be the great wave of the future. We'll be able to share prediction patterns among the, the uh, different libraries, and not everybody will have to set up their own. Um, and it didn't really pan out the way we thought it would back at the time. And so the question now for the partnership was, should we build a fully predictive check-in system, or should we try to scale back and do something else? Have we, has that, that boat sailed, as it were? Uh, and for any of you who are really interested in this, if you come to NASIG in Buffalo in June, I'm doing a session on the history of predictive check-in and where it stands now. Uh, so you can get a whole hour on it if you want. So what did we do in the project? Um, well, we, the OLA project divides up into spec writing teams, spec meaning a functional specification. So the partners provide staff to write functional specs saying, here's what we want the system to do. Uh, so we formed a lot of teams, discussed internally how we wanted it to do. We went through a whole user story exercise where staff at each of the participating partner libraries got together and just said, that their instruction was, what do you do all day? What did you do yesterday? Tell me in detail what you did yesterday. And they actually wrote them down on three by five cards and we collated them. And from that, tried to get a picture of just what does everybody do with an ILS all day? And that was the original basis for the functional specs, saying, all right, how do we describe this function and how do we want to make this system do it? The specs were written and the way the OLA process works is we run functional specs and then we've hired a, a programming company, uh, in this case a company called HTC Global Services, that we hand them off to and they actually write the code. So it's not library staff writing the code, but we're writing the specifications. And as far as serials go, we were interested to find how much consensus there was among the different partners. Like I said before, everybody said that we would still want to support serials check-in, but that it's not as important to us as it used to be, and that we didn't want to spend as much staff time on it as we had been spending up till now. And the team came to consensus fairly quickly, saying that full prediction probably wasn't worth the effort anymore, that something simpler that can still give us something to, to prompt us for check-in, but that doesn't require so much maintenance was okay. Um, there wasn't unanimity on that exactly at first, particularly from those uh, partners that had law libraries, because the law library people said, we still get a higher percentage of our material in print than the main library does, uh, and we still need to be able to handle it. But in the end, even the law librarians came around and said, well, maybe we don't need full prediction anymore. We can get by with something simpler. Uh, so long as we can check it in and we have triggers for claiming. Something else which was interesting in this process, a lot of people said, we want the serials receiving to be separate from the purchase order. Because a lot of us have spent years building purchase orders for things that don't actually need purchase orders in that they don't ever get paid and no communication necessarily needs to go to the vendor. But in our current systems, the check-in records are linked to the purchase orders. So we said, let's see if we can get away from that link and have those records interrelate but not be necessary to have a PO in order to do check-in. So what we did is we wrote this up as a white paper uh, proposing that we do check-in but in a simpler form based on what we're calling action intervals, and we'll show you that as we go along. 
uh, that went up the ladder to the Olay Functional Council, which is people from all the Olay partners, usually people like their head of tech services. And then from them to the Olay board, which is the library directors of all the Olay partners. They approved that, so we went ahead and wrote the specifications for freestanding serials checking record. And we went ahead and designed mock-ups for the serials receiving and the serials re uh, receipt screens. Um, there are some great mock-up tools out there, but we actually used Excel because it was really, really simple to do it that way. Uh, and those of us on the team didn't necessarily have a lot of graphics experience, but we said, you know, what we need is kind of like a grid. Excel can give us a grid. So we went ahead and did it that way. So I'm going to take you over and show you the mock-up in just a moment. Um, uh, like I said, it's not live. Well, actually, I think I'll show you the Excel file. Uh, the URL that I put in here is to the version of the mock-up that's in the Qualio Lay Google Docs space. We used Google Docs to store all of our documents as we were going along working. Um, so the, I'm assuming people will have access to this PowerPoint afterwards. Uh, and so you can get this URL from there. So if you hold on one moment, I am going to share my desktop. Okay. Um, can somebody just unmute and let me know if you can see that? Todd or Linda or Kristen? I yeah. can see it, Bob. Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure. So I'm actually going into Excel here and showing you the um, the mock-up for the serials receiving screen. By the way, we chose to drop the term serials check-in because the circulation people complained saying that check-in to them has a completely different meaning. Uh, and we said, okay, receiving is a clearer uh, name for this that doesn't isn't so confusing. So what we did is dis design just a very simple serials check-in record um, that has two main parts to it, the header part, the part at the top t tells you what you're checking in with data reflected from the bibliographic record uh, and then a bunch of other fields telling you what it's linked to so this check-in record is linked to a purchase order like I said that link is optional but in, if you have a PO and you want to link to it you can uh, it's linked to a vendor record a bib record instance record instance is always name for holdings and items and the reason they have a name for it is that in the database structure in Olay, uh, holdings and items are actually stored as one document. So that document is called an instance record. Um, you've got your bound, your unbound locations, and then a bunch of other fields talking about what you need done with this. It's an active subscription. Uh, it's checked in by the serials department in the main library. Labels get printed for it when you're done. Um, receiving record type main, the idea is that there would be three record types, you know, uh, main, supplement, and index corresponding to the three parts in the MARC holdings standard for that. Copy numbers, if you're using them, do you want an item created when you check each one in? Three different kinds of notes, the urgent note being one that, uh, that po you have to acknowledge when you go to do the check-in. So if there's something in there, it's going to make you say okay to that. You can't see that in the mock-up, but there's going to be a little OK box that comes up. The other two, you don't have to acknowledge um, the claiming note down here. And then the second half of the screen uh, is where you actually do the receiving and where it stores the receipt history. So the idea is that uh, the uh, receiving record will store a little of the information that's been in prediction patterns for a lot of us. So like captions. So this thing calls itself volume part year month. So that data is encoded into the zeros receiving record and will come up every time. But because there's no actual prediction, you're going to have to fill in, the operator will have to type in what it is you're checking in. So this 12 and 1 that are here is data that the operator is going to have to put in in order to check in volume 12, part 1. Likewise, you're going to have to type the year and month that's on the issue. So once you do that and you, uh, you that creates that issue, you can then decide what you want to do. You can just click receive and receive will put it down into the receipt history. You can click claim if what you actually want to do is claim this issue. 
and that will generate a claim message. Olay will be able to generate two types of claim message. One is an at a fact claim message that you'll be able to send to vendors that can get claims by EDI. And the other is a printed piece of paper. What it's actually going to do is generate a PDF from a template that you put in and that you can mail off. If you want a public note for that issue, you put it there. And then down below is just the receipt history uh, saying what it is you've received. So these are all issues that have been received. This, uh, this uh, title, the receipt status is received for these first three. The fourth one is claimed, so that hasn't been received and you can see that we're using colors to indicate that. Uh, for those that have been received, the receipt date is filled in. For the ones that haven't been received, if you scroll over to the right, you can see a claim date and a claim count. So the uh, most recent claim for this was December 23rd. It was the second claim. It was for a skipped issue. It had a note on it saying, please send to us ASAP. And then there's also a space to input your claim response if you get one back from the vendor. Yeah. So what this is, is working off of in terms of uh, to, uh, prompting you for claiming is this field up here, the action interval. And this is something that some current systems and some older systems had too. It's a very simple, it's just a frequency type uh, prompt that works off of the check-in and works in terms of number of days. So if I check in this issue today, the system's just going to say, all right, if nothing else has been checked in on this record in 90 days, then this title is going to have to go onto the problem list. Uh, or the action list saying, hey, you need to look at this. Um, the date that it generates is stored here. So that's 90 days after the previous check-in. Uh, that date is manually editable so that if it predicted 90 days but you decide you want to give it longer, you just go in and manually edit that date. Uh, so there, there's still a lot of uh, interpretation, a certain amount of interpretation required of the staff. They need to look at this when it comes up in the action list and say, look at the receipt history and say, okay, here's when I got my issues. Do I feel ready to claim it or not? Um, so that doesn't go away, but still it's simpler and hopefully simple enough that for instance, if you're, you have your students doing the check-in, they can just go in, create their issues, click receive and, uh, the system will do the rest. Uh, and there were some of our partners who said, yes, they have student workers doing check-in and they want to be able to continue to support that. And down at the bottom, it's just, you can see there's separate receipt history sections for supplements and indexes if you checked any of those in. Um, and there's an audit trail at the bottom just saying who created the check-in record and when, who updated it, on what machine, uh, the last update date. So that's basically it. We wanted it to be simple and straightforward and just have a date that would prompt us for claiming but still be able to check things in. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and go back to the PowerPoint. And I will hand it over to Kristen at this point to talk about what we're doing with electronic acquisitions. Great, thanks, Bob. And can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I just made you the presenter in case you need it. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, as Todd said earlier, I'm the chair of the e acquisition spec writing team for Koalio Bay. And so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the work that our team has been doing and the efforts that we're making to address some of the big challenges in ERM. So before I jump into the details, I just want to tell you a little bit about our e-acquisition spec writing team. Um, and Bob talked a little bit about the structure of the project. And so we're made up of volunteers from many of the OA partner schools, although not all of them. And I just wanted to kind of give a little shout out to our team members because these are all great people who are experts, um, practitioners in serials and e-resources librarianship. And we all do this in addition to our regular jobs. So I really appreciate the efforts of everybody who's been participating. Um, 
So we've been addressing writing functional specifications for all areas of electronic resources acquisition. So selection, purchasing, licensing, trials, access, and in some cases, work has already been done in some of these areas, and in some cases, not. So we're um, integrating with the rest of the project when, when necessary and kind of striking out on our own at some points, too. And um, I just have a quick disclaimer, which is that our team is writing uh, functional specifications at the moment, and none of them have even begun to be coded. So at this point, a lot of our work is kind of still conceptual, and I can't guarantee that the end product will be exactly what I'm describing today, but at a high level, I think this really represents the direction that we want to go. Um, so here's just a quick overview of what I'll be talking about. I'll start out with a quick discussion about the problem space, so those issues that we're attempting to address with Koalio Lay. And then I'll talk about a few of the specific solutions that we're working on. So our data model, our integration with GoKB, which is the global open knowledge base, and our workflow management solutions. So the problem space that Ove hopes to evolve is one that I'm sure we're all familiar with, and that is the development of a system that is truly integrated and that truly can manage the entire e-resource lifecycle. And so, I mean, we've had ERM systems for about a decade now, and these systems have moved us forward, and they've been good in many respects, but I think there's a few major problems that really the industry is, and the field as a whole is just beginning to address. And so some of the ones that stand out to me in light of what our group has been doing are, first, that Despite the popularity of ERMs, the ILS has remained a silo. It really hasn't benefited from that work, and it hasn't really had an update to its data model in a long time, and I think that's something that we definitely are trying to address. The second is that the knowledge bases at up to this point have been primarily used to support access. So you have a knowledge base that supports your link resolver or your mark record service or your discovery layer. But we're really looking at taking a knowledge base and integrating it and using it for management and using it to support acquisitions and back-end functionality. So I think that's a new direction. And finally, a lot of previous ERMs have lacked flexible workflow management. So either they don't really have workflow tools at, tools at all, or they've had workflow tools that are very predefined. So they basically tell you, you can do workflow, but you have to do it this way. And that doesn't work for a lot of people. Um, but that being said, um, I think that the ERM experiment that we've lived through has been really instructive, and it's been a positive experience. And I think one of the primary lessons that we've gotten from that is that the industry is really beginning to understand that e-resources are not just something special, they're not an exception that needs its own little system. They're really the bulk of our collections. They need to be an integrated part of our core systems. And I think that's been one of our guiding principles in designing Olay. So I'll start by talking about the data model and the question of how can we build a data model that matches the reality of what we really buy. So um, the, first, the first key point that I'll talk about is that we have tried to create hierarchy within our data model. So we all know that many e-resources are sold as part of packages and that you need to manage both the package and the titles that are within that package. And sometimes you even need to manage packages that are within packages. And in the traditional ILS, this was really difficult to do. There's really no support for this kind of concept. And if you're anything like my library, you just kind of got around this with elaborate systems of notes and dummy records and workarounds that kind of got you what you needed, but not really. So to address this in Koalio Bay, we've created a concept that we're calling the e-resource record. And this is kind of one of the foundational pieces of our design. And basically, this is a record that allows you to manage both your collection and the titles within it. So an e-resource 
has its own set of metadata, things that describe the package or the bundle as a whole. And then that e-resource can contain more bundles and it can contain individual titles. And then if the bundles contain individual titles, those will sort of link back up to the top level. And so this really allows you to manage your collection at multiple levels. Um, the second concept that I'll talk about is called the instance. And Bob mentioned this a little bit earlier, which in the general scope of Coalio Lay, it's a combination of the holding and item record like you might see in a traditional ILS. But for e-resources, we're kind of taking the concept of the, intra, of the instance and using it to manage different versions of the same title. So most e-journals are sold in multiple ways by multiple vendors, they're on different platforms, and really you need to manage what you bought, not the title. And so in a traditional ILS, you basically had the bib record. You had to link your PO to the bib record. That was kind of the center of the universe. But in a way, the instance becomes more of the center of the universe. Um, it's your primary point of management. You can link instances to your e-resource record. So that brings together all the instances that are sold together in a package or bundle. Um, and you can also use the instance to store information about that instance. So things like coverage dates, post cancellation access, um, and possibly things like usage statistics in the future. And that's data that really does describe an instance. It doesn't describe the title level. Uh, you'll also be able to link purchase orders to instances so you know exactly which version of the title you paid for. Um, finally, the other key feature of the data model is that it integrates ERM functionality with the traditional ILS functions. Um, and the e-resource record is kind of at the center of it all. It pulls together all of the key information about that purchase. So the instances that make up that e-resource, the license that governs that e-resource, the purchase orders that um, could be linked to those individual instances or which could be linked directly to the e-resource if it's a one-line payment. And access, and while, as Bob said, there's no OPAC and there's also, at this point, no link resolver or mark record service or traditional access tools that are part of Kalali LA, um, we still want to make sure that people can use the system to manage the workflow of setting up all those access points because that's really key. So this really is kind of a one-stop shopping approach that eliminates separation between, you know, this data is in the system and this one's over here. It's all together. So next I'll talk a little bit about GoKB, which is the Global Open Knowledge Base. And in case people aren't familiar with that project, I'll just go over quickly um, what exactly that project is. And so GoKB is another Mellon-funded project. It's kind of a sister project to Kualio Bay. It has many of the same people involved, but it has its own kind of structure and it's operating pretty much independently. And the goal of that project is to build an open knowledge base um, that would be available for anyone who wants to use it. It will be community maintained um, in part by the Olay partners, but we're also working towards a model where other people in the library world who rely on this data can become part of that community. It will have enhanced data elements, so it will, its goal is to track changes over time, to track future packages, to track identifiers, so kind of going a little bit beyond what is in today's knowledge bases. And it'll have APIs so that any project can interact with this data. Um, you know, it is an, a knowledge base for Olay, but it's also a knowledge base for anyone else who wants to use it. So how will GoKB enhance quality Olay? Um, the first way is that it will provide data so that we don't have to create it. And this diagram shows just a handful of the data elements that GoKB will provide. Um, it's more to just show you that data is going to flow from one system to the other, so don't worry too much about reading each one of those. Um, and so one of the ideas that we've talked about is that 
when users are working in Koalio Bay and say creating a new e-resource record for the first time and creating instance records for the first time, they'll be able to use GoKB as kind of seed data to create that. So they'll actually be able to search GoKB from within the Koalio Bay interface, pull in that basic metadata, and use it to create or populate records in the system. So create brief bid records, create instances, pull in metadata to the e-resource or platform records. And this um, will both save time from, for data entry, and it also will populate away records with GoKB identifiers, which I'll talk a little bit more about in my next couple slides, why those are important. Um, so one of the other benefits that we hope to see from GoKB is that it will help manage change. And so GoKB will be tracking changes over time. So things like transfers between publishers, title changes, platform migrations, the type of thing that we see a lot of in e-resources management. Um, and because the data in a way will be linked to GoKB using the GoKB identifiers that have gotten pulled into the system, these changes can be pushed out to OA after they occur in GoKB. Um, and so the idea will be that GoKB users will have multiple options on their local end to handle those changes. So um, one option might be, and we're still sort of flushing out exactly how this will work, but the option to have those changes automatically take effect in OA. So if a title, say, moves from Springer to Wiley, GoKB could automatically send you new records for the Wiley version and automatically tell Koalio Bay to close out the records for the Springer version. We've also talked about having another option where you could just receive alerts and then take those actions manually. And of course, you don't have to use this functionality, so you would have the option not to receive those updates at all. But our hope is that this will really help manage kind of the ever-changing e-resources landscape. And finally, GoKB hopes to work as kind of a co-referencing service to bring together identifiers from different sources. So the idea being that there would be a GoKB ID that could be associated with all kinds of different identifiers, like things like ISSNs or DOIs, but possibly even things like vendor identifiers or proprietary identifiers from a vendor's knowledge base. And what this would do would basically be to allow you to map your data into another system using the GoKB identifier as kind of a connector. Um, and this is still a work in progress, and it's definitely dependent on the GoKB project getting buy-in from other organizations and other vendors who might be willing to share their identifiers. But I think that it could be one of the best things about GoKB. Um, just for an example, you know, we've talked about the idea that many people may continue to maintain a vendor knowledge base for their link resolver or for products like Summon or EDS, and that having these IDs may allow you to do things like export your holdings from Olay with your vendor's identifiers in them to make it easy to do automated uploads to another knowledge base. So that's kind of the type of functionality that we've been thinking about. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about workflows and the question of how we can manage complex nonlinear workflows. Um, so the first concept that we've come up with within our team is the idea of managing high-level workflows. So um, just from kind of discussion among our team, the consensus seems to be that most libraries have some kind of system where workflow moves across departments as a resource is acquired. So you might start out collection management, then go through acquisitions and cataloging before it's available to users. Um, and so we've talked about a system for managing this workflow where each e-resource record would be associated with a workflow like this one, where each stage can be locally defined. Um, you can have as many stages as you want. It could be, you know, 10, or it could just be one if you're at a small organization where you really don't have a lot of handoff points. Um, 
but we also acknowledge that what happens in each stage is going to be different at each institution. And a lot of times what happens in each stage is going to be different even within the same institution, just based on the purchase and its particular circumstances. So to a large extent, this workflow is still human controlled. The idea being that each stage would have an owner, which could be an individual or a group of people who would be responsible for that stage and making sure that what needs to happen happens while the owner is in possession of the e-resource. Um, and once they finish their part, they can then kind of click a button that says, I'm done, and that will automatically move the workflow to the next stage and notify the next owner. And we've also talked a lot about making sure that there is a fully featured system of alerts and notifications so that people can be alerted when work has come their way or if there's work that's not getting done. And I'll talk a little bit more about that too. We've also talked about managing sub-processes in addition to the high-level workflow. And so um, we identified four common sub-processes that seem to apply at many libraries. And right now those are trials, licensing, access, and purchasing. And the things that we kind of realized about these processes is that each process may or may not occur for a given resource. It's, you know, it's very rare that you could say, we always do a trial or we always have a license. So you may or may not need each one. The processes may cross department lines, so they may need a mix of people working on them. And they also might operate independently of each other. So it's hard to say this one would always start first or when you finish purchasing, then do access because there's always exceptions. So you need to be able to vary the order and do multiple processes at the same time. So the way that we have been specking out this workflow is that for each e-resource, any of these sub-processes can be used as needed and any one of them can be started at any time. Um, each one will be able to have its own locally definable workflow, which can be simple or complex depending on each individual institution's needs, and that each process will sort of run through all of its steps and will also have a system of alerts and notifications, both so that the people involved in the sub-process can know when it's their turn to do a certain task, but also so that the high-level owner of the e-resource will know where each of those processes is and receive alerts when those processes are completed or for if, for example, one of those processes is stalled and no actions have been taken, there will be somebody who's aware of that so that they can kind of get it jump started. And finally, one of our guiding principles for workflow is that we need to take the burden off of human memory. And so this is actually my one real screenshot from Koalia Lay that I've included since it's building on a concept that was already part of Olay and I think part of KFS as well, and that's called an action list. And the idea is that each user of the system has an action list. When they log in, they can go to their action list and see what tasks have been assigned to them. And um, both the high-level workflow and the sub-processes will be able to generate action items that show up in this action list and, um, and will let people know what needs to be done. In addition to kind of generating alerts at certain points in time. We've also been working on a specification for the ability to create ad hoc alerts, which would be something you create whenever a task comes up that needs to be done that's outside of your normal workflow. And so this could happen both during the initial acquisition of a resource or any time after. You could go into any of your records and basically type up a little note that says, this needs to be done on this date. and fill in the date, and then on that day, that alert will show up in somebody's action list so that they'll know that they need to do it. And then when a user has completed a task in their action list, they can mark it as done and it will move on. Um, and so just the idea being that Olay really becomes kind of 
your dashboard where you have your list of tasks and you don't have to think to yourself, okay, let me go through my email and now I have to go back to my ILS and it really kind of centralizes the process. So that's been another thing that we've really tried to focus on. Okay, and so that's it for my slides. So if anybody has any questions, we can start to answer those now. Well, there have been a few put into the Q&A box. Um, so why don't I start with those? Actually, they, they were all uh, related to print so far. Okay. So let me start with those. Um, Nancy put in a question in the serials receipt screen. I didn't see a place with the vendor reference number for tally receiving. Isn't that important for EDI claiming? It is, and that, that's actually an interesting comment uh, that made me think a little bit. The way we've spec'd it out is that the uh, vendor's reference number is stored on the purchase order line item. And I think there was an unspoken assumption there that even though you don't have to have purchase orders for every title in order to check them in, that you would probably have purchase orders for anything that you're getting from a vendor with whom you're going to be doing EDI claiming or EDI invoicing. But it does make me wonder, should that data either be repeated on the serials receipt record or should it actually be stored in the serials receiving record instead of in the PL line item? Um, because the assumption is that if you don't have a PO, you can still claim uh, from the serials receiving record so long as you've linked the serials receiving record to a vendor record so that the system knows who to send the claim to. So I'm going to go back and talk to the team and say maybe we should move that vendor reference number off the PO and into the serials receipt um, on the assumption that, at least for serials, you're always going to have that receiving record for anything that you would be doing EDI with. Um, so that, that's interesting. Let me go back. Uh, Grace Mary uh, put in a question. We would fill the note field of the checking record with standard language so that we can extract reports in, lot, in that area. Would that be a possibility? It would, um, though it wouldn't come out of the box that way. But Olay has a very strong backend that allows it to build specially designed workflows or business rules. So if you want Olay to do something that it doesn't come out of the box ready to do, you can probably write a business rule that would allow you to do it. So if you wanted to store data in a note field in a standard form and tell the system to use that form, uh, so long as it's in a form that's describable in a business rule, which um, it's, a, it's stored in an XML file, then you should be able to do that. It will probably require a little involvement from your programmers, um, and that's true for Synamp rules, I would say, throughout the system. But uh, so as long as you can describe them and have somebody who can do uh, write a little bit of XML, you should be able to do make the system do pretty much anything you want it to do. And what I like to tell people is the more work you put into setting up your workflows, the more of the work the system will do for you. Uh, Rebecca had asked, what's the trigger for second print claims? This is also an interesting one, uh, and unfortunately I don't have a mock-up for it, but uh, we did two things with, with second claims. One is there's going to be a screen listing all outstanding claims. So just a, a sortable list saying here's everything you've sent claims for. So there will be sites that just choose to work that way. They'll have somebody go through and sort that, you know, by vendor and date, for instance, and say, all right, show me everything from EBSCO that was claimed more than two months ago, and from that decide whether they want to send another claim. But if they want something more uh, in the nature of an alert, something pushed to a particular person saying, hey, whenever this claim is more than two months or three months old, I want it to show up in this person action list, Again, that should be a fairly simple rule to write. It won't come out of the box with it, but you can just fairly easily write a rule that says just look at these claim dates and any that are three months old or older, you know, uh, send them to this role. Uh, and you have people associated with given roles, and so it would just appear then in their action list as a sort of push for that. A couple of new ones have come in since then. Is there a timeline for a beta version of the ERMS? Um, 
timelines in general for LA, the release 0 0.8 is just about to come out uh, within the next month or two. Um, the first ERM functionality will be in release 1.0, which I believe is scheduled for sometime around September, October of 2013. Um, and then there's going to be a release 1.5, which is going to follow fairly soon after that. With, uh, pro they're aiming for December 2013. And by that point, you, the system is supposed to have all the functionality in it that you could need to actually operate live. Um, right. And the, all the functionality that I just talked about, we are aiming to have that in version 1.0. And then 1.5 will think about adding additional ERM-based functionality and also kind of refining what we do for 1.0. Since a lot of this is pretty new, I think we're, you know, we're trying it and we'll see if we get it right on the first try, but I think we'll definitely have opportunities to go back and kind of tweak what we came up with and make it better. Um, there was a message on, that came in via the chat that said, can you tell us what the time frame is for coding the print receiving screens and for the e-resource functionality? The print receiving screens are actually in the hands of the, the coders right now, so they're working on them. I haven't seen them yet, but uh, they are writing code for them as we speak. E-resource stuff uh, where is not yet in the hands of the coders. The initial batch of specifications is due to be approved very shortly. Actually, we have a meeting Monday morning at which uh, a couple of them are going to be approved. And after that, they'll be handed off to the coders. There are a couple of, um, of versions of Olay available for people to look at. There's a server called the demo server. And if you go to the, you know, if you just Google Quali Olay and go to the Olay homepage, you'll find links to it there that shows you available uh, functionality. Um, unfortunately, the demo server is only updated when an official release comes out. So what's there right now is still the functionality from release 0 0.6, which came out last year. And 0 0.8 functionality won't be there until it's officially released. So even though we've seen some of it, uh, it the general public can't see it just yet. But at least the 0 0.8 stuff will be up there fairly soon. Uh, so there's a question here from Susan who asked, where would financial information be found for electronic resources? We would often need it at the point of looking at titles, bundles, resources, etc. So financial information will be found in purchase orders, which in many ways are similar to what you would deal with in a traditional ILS. But what we're trying to do is make them a little bit more, a little bit easier to make purchase orders for the things that as we actually buy them. So the, one of the ideas we've talked through is that you'll be able to create purchase orders for individual titles, but also create purchase orders for an e-resource as a whole. So if you had, say, an e-resource where some of the titles have historic subscriptions that you continue to pay, you can have individual purchase orders for those titles. But then say you pay an additional fee for kind of like an Elsevier Freedom collection where you just get a bunch of extra titles, but they're not itemized, you could then have one purchase order that would just describe that whole e-resource. And that would also allow you to do purchase orders for things like um, access fees for back files and things where, like I know for our, us and our current system, we're constantly creating all these dummy record, dummy bib records for fees. And in this system, you hopefully could get away from creating lots of dummy bibs and attaching POs to them. You could just attach POs directly to your e-resources package. And then uh, Susan also asked what kind of reporting we're envisioning. And I think if you ask our team, they would say everything. But um, <laughs> we really have not even embarked on that yet. We know it's a big question, and I think it's going to be one of the things we talk about for release 1.5. So we definitely know it's important, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. The, um, the general philosophy, I think, for reporting is that you're going to be using reporting tools tied into the system, not that there's going to be like a reporting module built into OLA, but that people will be able to use whatever reporting software they want to pull things out. And, uh, format them. 
Um, and one other thing on the financial information, we've been having a lot of discussions lately about uh, data to repeat from, from different screens. Um, so since uh, in uh, actual prices paid are going to be attached to invoices which are attached to purchase orders, that doesn't mean that from the e-resource record, which is the home record for ERM data, that you won't be able to see that data. Uh, you will be able to see kind of a payment history from the e-resource record, even though you can't input it there. You'll be inputting it over on the invoice. But we're trying to repeat certain things in certain places, and we've had a lot of discussions about, well, should this field be editable for both places, or should it only be editable from here and just reflect it there? Um, but the idea is that we don't want you to have to click around uh, from record to record to record in order to find out what you need to know. Right. Um, and yeah, right. the e-resource record actually will have multiple tabs so that it will link out to not just the purchase order information to pull that in, but license information, trial information, access information, um, a kind of event log where you can do notes and things that happen. So it really will kind of pull together the whole universe of that e-resource. I just realized uh, Patrick's question about the timeline, uh, he said specifically for a beta version. The idea is that release 0 0.8 would be the first version that a site might want to uh, put up locally in order to play with it. You know, if you want to put it, a, a copy of it on your server to see like what would it be like to load your data into it or something like that, uh, that's the first version you'll be able to do that. Um, we haven't been labeling things beta, at least so far. Uh, when a release has come out, it's just come out. Uh, but then again, these are all 0.x releases so far. Uh, I assume once we get past 1.0, there'll probably be a more formal beta process. And you know. The understanding is that once we reach 1.0, this becomes an open source product. Uh, and so you can, at that point, download it and use it for free. You can add things to it. And hopefully, if you add good things to it, contribute them back to the community. We have, um, you know, we have libraries that are not partners in the Olay project because they've come to us and say, we're really interested in your product, but we don't have any money. So once it becomes open source, we're going to use it. And we say, great, okay, well, we're happy to talk to you. You, you can't formally uh, influence the design process because you're not a, a partner. To, but uh, you know, once we get to 1.0, we, we definitely want you on board. Right, and we're hopeful too that the individual institutions that do use the product, they may, people will have the opportunity to develop their own little add-ons and tools for the system. And so we're hopeful that they'll share those back to the larger group and there'll be some kind of code bank that people can draw on. We're even looking to take some of our code that we've developed and give it to the quality financial system, kind of pay it back to them for all the code they've given us and say, hey, here's what we think's an improvement in what you had. All right, well, Bob and Kristen, thank you very much, but we have reached our hour mark. So uh, if Bob and Kristen weren't able to answer your questions, uh, you have access to their email addresses here. So I'm sure they'd be happy to answer any other questions you might have. Um, again, we are, have recorded the session and a copy of the recording and a copy of Bob and Kristen's PowerPoint will be provided to all the registrants uh, by sometime next week. And again, as you log out, you'll be redirected to a survey. And I ask again that you please fill that survey out to give us an idea of how we're doing, what we can do to improve, and what other uh, presentations you might be interested in us doing as webinars. And with that, on behalf of the NASIG Continuing Education Committee and Bob and Kristen, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Bob and Kristen, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. And thank you all, and have a good rest of the day. Well, thanks. Yeah, thanks everyone and thanks Todd for coordinating. Okay, thank you.